If you've been following my music production live streams for any amount of time, you know that I am an unapologetic super fan of The Unfinished, aka Matt Bowdler, especially his Zebra and Omnisphere presets, which have quickly become a mainstay in my own compositional toolkit. Well, I was lucky enough to sit down and chat with Matt recently, and we talk sound design, we talk creating presets, as well as his experience being a part of the team that worked on the Oscar award-winning soundtrack for Dune by Hans Zimmer. Plus, we're gonna listen to a corporate cue written by a member of the 52 Cues community on this week's episode of the 52 Cues podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the 52 Cues podcast, a weekly podcast where we take a deep dive into the topics specifically pertaining to the library and production music industries. Plus, we listen to a cue written by you, a member of the 52 Cues community. Just what is the 52 Cues community? Well, we are a diverse and interactive network of composers and producers devoted to writing better production music through lifelong learning, mutual support, and encouragement to others along their journey. And we start and focus on writing just one cue per week. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for finding us, however you found us. I also want to give a special word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of the 52 Cues community without whose support none of this would be possible. You don't hear mattress commercials or HelloFresh codes. Instead, we are 100% supported by the 52 Qs community. So uh, if you want to, you can use the timestamps in the description below to skip around today's episode because we're going to be listening to Mellow Corp by Andrew Thomas. And I thought it'd be really, really interesting to talk about corporate music and what it means to write a corporate cue. But first, I was so excited to finally sit down and catch up with uh, with a, 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 a composer and programmer who I have quickly become a huge fan of. So without further ado, here is my interview with Matt Bowdler. I am sitting here with one of my one of my newest heroes. I'm I'm not ashamed to admit that. Uh, one of my newest heroes, Matt Bowdler of the Unfinished, aka the Unfinished. And if if you don't know Matt, uh, I guarantee you you've heard his work. He's a composer, sound designer, a synth programmer. His credits include No Time to Die, The Crown, Fear the Walking Dead, Call of Duty, Black Ops 4, Titanfall 2, and most recently, the Oscar winning. He was part of the Oscar-winning team of the Dune soundtrack. He's collaborated with Hans Zimmer, Steve Barton, Lauren Balf, just to name a few sound design for, for Yuhei, Spectrosonic, Spitfire, Sonic Couture. I am giddily excited to welcome Matt Bowdler to the 52 Cues podcast. Matt, how are you doing, my friend? I'm very well. Thank you very much. Were you reading that all from my website? Um, uh, <laughs> may I may have I may have that bookmarked. I may not. <laughs> oh, it's useful. And my, my about bit on my site is useful for something, so that's good. It it it's absolutely. <laughs> and I didn't even get into testimonials from like Jason Graves, Trevor Morris, Mac Coyle, all of those folks. But uh, Matt, it is so good to have you. Uh, listeners to the podcast, viewers of the live stream are no stranger to your work because I can't stop talking about your Omnisphere sound sets and for me, most recently, getting into your Zebra mm -hmm. sound sets. And, and I, it's just become such a cornerstone of my own workflow. And I just want to start with with that, let's start with those sound sets and your journey from, hey, I'm a composer doing work on TV to creating sound sets for Spectrosonics and for your own works. Can we talk a little bit about that? Of course. Um, so, I, well, I guess my journey wasn't really from strictly from composer to sound designer because at the point at which I started doing um, synth programming, my my composing career was of absolutely no note whatsoever. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I've got no no useful or interesting credits at that stage to speak of. Um, I, I kind of fell into it really. Um, a friend of mine, a guy called Jeff, he who some people might know as Bluff Monkey, um, he was basically badgering me, saying that 
um, I should release some of my sounds commercially. Um, I used to lurk on KVR audio mm-hmm. on their forums. Uh, I'd occasionally put up a piece of music that I was doing. I was t- in those days, I was tending to do sort of um, breakbeat remixes of stuff. And yeah, he, he basically kept suggesting I should do it for the best part of about 18 months. This is about 10 years ago. And I finally capitulated and released a handful of sounds for uh, Native Instruments Massive, a little thing called Massive Dark Score I did. I think it was about 40 patches. Um, I probably failed to put my name on half of them. Um, the mod wheel programming was probably abysmal. Um, actually, I'm not sure you can program the mod wheel on Massive. So probably didn't exist at all. <laughs> um, yeah, and that was reasonably popular. Um, had some good feedback. So I thought I'd chance my arm of releasing something for actual money. Um, and I did uh, like a hundred, the classic 128 patches bank for it and sold it for about £15 pounds or something. And yeah, it sold a handful of copies um double figures at least and uh but i got one i got an email from um a games composer called sasha de Kachian. probably pronounced that incorrectly apologies sasha if i have um he's done game soundtracks for tron um uh, all sorts and he basically just contacted me and said do you want to do some sounds for me for my next game um which was a zombie game and I said, yes, obviously. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of how it all began. So I, I owe Jeff and Sasha a depth of gratitude for kicking me up the arse and making me start on this, this, this path to whatever it is I'm currently doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, like, like I said, it's, it, they've been hugely influential and, and ha- have, have you kind of been out in the wild watching things or or uh, or uh, playing a game or something and heard your sounds and you didn't like it wasn't a bespoke thing but you just heard your sound you're like hey uh, that's that's one of mine yeah I've, I've i've done that a few times and it was easier to do earlier on in my career um when i hadn't released quite so much now that i've released i don't know something something close to about 40 sound sets and i've been doing it for for for, for 10 years now it's much more difficult to recognize what I've done because there's just so much of it out there. But yes, I've, I've, I've watched documentaries and even, uh, like, um, oh, what are they called? Um, the Christmas, the, the U S Christmas movies. Who is it? Who is it? Does all the, Oh, like life, uh, uh, life to Hallmark Christmas. channel does like all those. Hallmark, that's yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. So I've watched Hallmark, Hallmark, um, movies i like christmas movies oh yeah um and yeah i've heard sounds on those so yeah i have heard them in a lot of places but yeah it's it's not so much nowadays just because i can't keep track of it all yeah and and you you cover a wide range of scents from the diva to omnisphere to zebra is it all part of the the same brain or is it is it really having to shift gears when you're doing diva presets versus zebra or omnisphere I definitely think that different synths point me in different directions. Um, I mean, I've done probably about a dozen different synths now. Um, and obviously things like Omnisphere and Zebra, I've done loads of sound sets for. And then there's been things like FM8 and Phonic 2, which I haven't done that much for because, part, well, FM8, FM synthesis is a, is a nightmare. But um, yeah, I guess sort of if I run out of, ideas of different directions to take things in i'll i'll sort of back off for a bit but um yeah i think i think the sense the sense leads you by the nose to a certain extent um and i don't often one, one thing that i've noticed i don't do is like, if i make a really nice sound in omnisphere i don't then sort of recreate it in another synth or and vice versa um which i think is hopefully a good thing because it means then that there's not too much repetition. I mean, at this stage, I'm, I'm, I'm almost certainly guilty of repetition, but, uh, but by doing, I guess, by doing that almost by accident, then, um, hopefully 
I'm not sort of repeating too much from one synth to the other. So I'm letting the character of each individual synth have its have its moment, I guess. Right. So when when you're in composing mode, do you know which synth you're going to go with, or do you open a synth and just start kind of stepping through patches, or do you just start creating something from scratch these days? Um, all of the above, I think. Um, I mean, I have I have certain synths that I rely on more heavily than others when I'm actually writing music, for sure. Um, Zebra, I would use on, yeah, 75% of decision-making. And if I want something um, more analog sounding, I'll go for Diva or Repro. And if I want something just to sort of sound really cinematic, I might, I might put up Omnisphere, but I'm, I find myself using Omnisphere less and less at the moment for some reason. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it will have to remain a mystery, that one. Um, and I think the, the synth that I'm, I've suddenly started using more and more often that I hadn't used at all before is Serum. Mm. It took me a real, a really long time to get into it for some reason. I, when I first fired it up, I was just, I don't know. I wasn't really something, something wasn't connecting. Um, which surprised me because obviously I, I kicked off with Massive and, and Serum's, you know, got a lot of the same vibe to Massive being a sort of a, a very sort of dance music friendly wavetable uh, synth. But it was only when I sort of, I guess, started making some sounds with it that didn't feel massive or, or, or particularly dancey that um, things finally clicked. And now I love it. And I find it really, really easy to program with and uh, can come up with some stuff I really like. And it makes, you know, a nice difference. It's, it's got a really different vibe and different sound to it from everything else I'm using. So it slots in quite nicely into my, my synth arsenal. So so you, you said at the beginning it didn't really click. Is it is it because maybe you're approaching it with another workflow in mind? And uh, if, if so... Maybe. Second? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've I use Yuhi synth so much that um, that yeah, maybe I was I was <laughs> if I could my brain couldn't turn off that it didn't sound particularly analog to me, even though it's not even supposed to. Well, you can, you know, you can do some faux hybrid analog kind of stuff. Um, I don't know really because it it, would, it took forever for me to really really sort of knuckle down, and then and then suddenly I was making ridiculous amounts of sounds for it, and I've got. I released my first Serum sound set last year, I think it was. Um, but in the sessions, the, the synth programming sessions for, for creating that sound set, I, I probably did three or four times as many sounds than I needed and ones that I liked as well. So, so I've got lots more um, Serum sound set ideas in the pipeline. Gotcha. So, uh, if uh, what, what would you say to a young composer or a new composer? You don't have to be young, but what would you say to somebody kind of new to the sound design and maybe they're intimidated? I, I admit, I'm, I'm asking this very selfishly because this is me. <laughs> uh, because when I open up Zebra, for example, I get completely overwhelmed. The same thing happens with Massive. There are just so many knobs, so many buttons, so many parameters that I get kind mm. of frozen in indecision and just find myself just scrolling through presets. Um, through your Omnisphere patches, I've been able to kind of work through that, but Omnisphere is a very different beast from Zebra. So what yeah. would you say to a, a composer new to sound design? How, how would you encourage them to, to get started and maybe get over that fear? Uh, well, I think one thing that worked for me was that when I started out, I, I focused on one synth, which was massive. Um, and I tried to learn as much as I could that, that massive did to, to try and create sounds I had in my head. Um, I think one of the most important aspects of, of any kind of sound design is, is listening, uh, and being able to sort of retain ideas in your head that, that you're trying to achieve. Uh, and then you've got to try and find that sort of journey from the init patch to, to the kind of thing you're, you're making. But I think, I think, um, yeah, focusing on one synth at a time is a, is a good way to do it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily actually select massive as the first starting point either. Um, that was, that was more out of the fact that 
I didn't have very many synths when I started out and I had uh, an early version of uh, Native Instruments um, complete, uh, probably probably version four or five or something. Um, so I had the, the NI synths and I kicked off with Massive because it was the most popular one. Um, and also I like making horrid filthy basses at the time <laughs> who who didn't back then <laughs> well <laughs> i still do i still love a filthy bass um maybe that's why i finally got into serum uh-huh. um yeah so i i and I, I did what i suppose most people do i i watched youtube videos and i played with presets and i changed them i reverse engineered them and i just tried to learn you know, how everything was connected in Massive. Um, but I would, yeah, I guess I guess I would probably suggest there are probably easier synths to do that with um, these days. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily go for something as complex as Zebra, although I, I know, I've, I, I've really clicked with Zebra straight away. So for me, it wasn't, it wasn't as intimidating as I know it is for some people because it is, semi-modular and there's there's all sorts of different connections and parameters um so probably something like like diva or repro would be a good start or or even something a little more basic like um uh togu audio lines uno lx juno recreation that's that's a really good one to start off with because it's you know it's one it's effectively one s was one was, wasps where am i talking about wasps? <laughs> one oscillator and you know there aren't a lot of parameters to to mess with to begin with and then you can move on to something else um but yeah uh, it's 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 listening is the key thing it's it's hearing what's happening when you're playing with a synth and trying to sort of connect that with what you're seeing at the same time gotcha yeah no that that makes perfect sense uh we've been talking you know a lot of these these synths that we've been talking about are uh, wavetable synths. One of the things that I really yeah. like about like Omnisphere and many of your patches are is granular synth, you know, bring, being able to bring in mm. an audio file and, and Omnisphere really, really excels at that. Um, when you're creating your Omnisphere patches, are you drawing from stock sounds or how much do you look to bring in your own, your own wave files and, and mangle those? Well, I, yeah, I've still only used stock sounds with my Omnisphere sound sets. Um, yeah, at some point, you know, it probably would be fun to bring in my own samples, but there hasn't really been a point where I've thought I've run out of sounds to use because there are so many <laughs> yes, are. in Omnisphere. And, um, um, you know, some of them are, well, they, they must be the best part of 20, 25 years old, some of the sounds in there, and they still sound great. And then there's, there's a million billion kalimba sounds if, if that's your thing. <laughs> um, it's not terribly my thing, but, um, but yeah, I mean, those kalimba sounds really come into their own when you, you are doing something like granular synthesis because you're making them sound as far away from a kalimba as, as you possibly can. Um, yeah, so I haven't used my own samples in, in Omnisphere at all, really. Um, no, yeah. I think, yeah, that's, 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 yeah, that's super encouraging because, uh, because I, I had already started getting into the mindset of, you know, recording my own bode symbol scrapes or something like that and bringing them in and, and mangling them, which is really, really cool. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. oh, you're right. There, the, the, the bench is so deep in Omnisphere that, uh, the fact that you've done how many uh, Omnisphere libraries? I mean, multiple iterations. You know, Colossus one through four, uh, uh, all of all of those, and you're still drawing from stock sounds. I think that's encouraging. It's also that means that uh, I don't know. Composers, I think, often will reach for something new in, instead of learning what they already have. So that's encouraging. Oh yeah, I mean that happens all the time. That's why I'm quite slow with releasing stuff for new synths because I want to spend a lot of time with them before I release a sound set because I don't want to release something that I don't think is good enough. Um, so there's been loads of fab since that have been released in the last sort of two or three years, which I've still barely even touched because, because I just, I've still had other things to release. I mean, I'm, on, I'm kind of almost, I'm backed up <laughs> with, <laughs> with things that I've done. 
um, because my release schedule kind of slowed down over the last couple of years, um, both deliberately and not Mm -hmm. deliberately. Um, So I've got things that I worked on two or three years ago that I haven't released yet. Um, I've got, like for Zebra, which I end up using all the time for my own projects and for bespoke stuff, um, I don't know, I've probably got, probably about eight sound sets begun for that or even finished in some cases were, that, that are ready to be released. Um, so I really need to get on with that really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are there, uh, are there any, uh, new synths? Um, you mentioned serum, but are there any new emerging synths that, uh, kind of excite you right now? Um, well, I, the, the synth that I'm releasing my next sound set for is brand new. I haven't done the sound set for that before, so uh, I could mention that. Technically, it'll be a, an exclusive for your, for your podcast, <laughs> if that's thrilling. Um, so that's um, Newfangled Audio's Generate, okay, which, which I really like because it's um, it's it's unique. I was going to say it's 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 really unique, but you don't need to say really unique. It's either unique or it isn't. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's my next sound set, and I've I've had a lot of fun playing with that, um, and that's that's something that probably will slowly come into my my music as well. Okay, is that now the that uh, the teaser done. artwork that's uh, that's over on your uh, your socials? The- yes. Oh wow! Yeah, that's that is an exclusive. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> that might by the time this airs, that might be that might have been released. But uh, no, definitely uh, get gets me really really curious because, like I said, it, it, whatever whatever you put your hands to, it's definitely interesting, and I'm going to I'm going to take a look at it. One of the things that in the production music world comes up frequently is using using samples uh and sample and melodies and progressions tripping up um content id systems it happens less i think in bespoke music mm. but uh using splice samples or or even sound sets like heavyosities loops or or something from oh, right, yeah. uh from an arpeggiator uh, can trip up these content ID systems. And I was wondering if that's anything that uh, you've experienced and is that anything even on your radars? And what makes me think is like Zebra, I know, has a really sophisticated arpeggiator. Um, Hans Zimmer used it famously in the uh, in the Batman Begins soundtrack and all of all of those uh, those sounds leaned a lot on the arpeggiator and allowing zebra to actually play those melodies uh, for you. Not that it's playing for you. You did the programming, but my point is, is that as somebody who releases sound sets, um, is that anything that's kind of on your radar programming arpeggiators, melodic fragments that could potentially cause some, um, some royalty flags down the road? Um, no, um, (laughs) (laughs) your problem. (laughs) You've just made me start thinking about it. Um, not really. I mean, yeah, there probably are. There probably are some patches that I've made in the past that might might sort of trigger that thing. I mean, one of the things I tend not to do is do those sort of all encompassing one fingered patches that play like really melodic stuff that that immediately stands out. I because of the way I write music and the way I use synths in my music. I'm, my focus is more on creating synths that are useful within a queue rather than a, a patch that's, that's essentially going to become the queue. Mm. Um, there's probably probably some of my um, soundscape stuff in Omnisphere. I could see I could see that triggering if if someone used one very heavily in a in a film score uh and then someone else used the same patch in like maybe a piece of music maybe maybe that could trigger it yeah, yeah I, I could i could see that happening with uh with stems you know if you have you know a, a bed stem and because yeah, your, your yeah. textures playable are are very playable but also just really good and so to have you know 10 seconds at the top of a queue of, of one of your patches that you're just kind of riding the mod wheel up and down. Um, but, um, I imagine that would be less than the melodic, the melodic stuff. And, um, that's yeah, something that's on. So. Say again. 
I, I, I would have thought it's sort of less likely to to trigger something like content ID. Um, yeah, anything that sort of veers towards a drone or a texture or a soundscape is, yeah, a it's, melody. I mean, there's there's stuff. Um, so when I sort of started out um, writing computer music, which is again about ten or so years ago. One of the first things I got for contact was Heavy Ocity's, um, uh Evolve. Mm -hmm. Was it Evolve? Yeah, Evolve. Yeah, Complete came with um, like Evolve and Evolve Mutations, kind of a, a stack of them. Yes. Yeah. So obviously there were a lot of melodic things in in that, and I would quite frequently hear some of the the melodic loops from that in in film and TV scores. And I imagine that's probably more likely to trigger anything than my stuff because, you know, it's a bit more, their stuff's a bit more complex and a bit more defined in the sense that, um, yeah, there was some really melodic stuff. And there's, there was a very, I think it was one of the Resident Evil films that, that basically the opening theme was essentially a uh, heavy austerity evolve patch, but possibly rewritten with other, with other synths and instruments, but it was very much, instantly recognizable <laughs> yeah i've heard garage band loops and commercials and all, all of those well, yeah it wasn't wasn't the uh the drum beat from uh rihanna's umbrella famously a, a garage band loop yeah i think so yeah yeah wow. and, yeah and so um yeah i just what was was curious if that was anything that was that was on your radar because i think the content id systems you know they kind of have like splice and sample makers in their crosshairs right now and and i i foresee yeah with some of these plugins uh being kind of next you know on, on the content id chopping block yeah because i think yeah i mean there's there's more and more with with library music more and more of um boiling it down to the individual stems isn't there to mm -hmm. send it off and i think if someone if the, the the editor picks one particular stem that's maybe like a really simple baseline or a texture then that runs for you know 10 or 20 seconds then yeah that that's something that could could definitely happen. Do I think about it very much? It it doesn't make me lose any sleep at night. Currently, right. no. <laughs> as a uh, as a as a working production music composer myself, it uh, it has caused me to lose some sleep. Uh, yeah, just because imagine. just because the libraries are really cracking down on it, you know, because mm -hmm. they're they they have a queue that's going to this show and this show and this show, and everything's getting uh, all. Uh, you know, all run through uh, content algorithms, you know, to track royalty payments and everything versus bespoke projects like a like a video game or a film, which isn't you're not taking the same score and trying to to play it under different shows or uh, or from different composers. So, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, I, I want to change gears just a little bit. And I want to talk about your work with with Hans Zimmer. And uh, I'd love to hear the story on how all of that came about, especially knowing his whole workflow with remote control and bleeding fingers and everything uh, in L.A. Uh, I would love to hear that story. And uh, again, congratulations on being part of that Dune team. That's that's okay. that's top of the hill, right? That's 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 the uh, the brass ring that so many film composers shoot for and, and uh, folks who yeah. are in the in that industry. So tell me about. Well, like I said to you before, I, I, I've peaked now, so <laughs> so everything from now on is is just it's all downhill, <laughs> right? Downhill, all of it. Um, how did that come about? So, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, I don't know. Hang on, I'm going to have to clear my throat. <clears> throat> edit that out. Um, yeah, so I I don't know exactly the the thought processes at um, at Hans's end to a certain extent. What I do know is that he contacted um, us at Yuhi to ask about um, anyone in the UK that was good at programming synths and specifically um, the Dark Zebra, uh, and this was for the Bond film No Time to Die. And so I got an email. Um, suddenly appeared in my main inbox from one of Hans's assistants saying Hans is trying to get hold of you and uh, can't get you on the num on your phone number. And uh, so I just sent them back my my phone number. And then I and then a few minutes later I got an email from from Earth saying you might be getting an e a phone call from Hans in a minute. 
I was like, I've already, <laughs> I've already heard from his assistant. So <laughs> that, that was a little bit of a shock. And then my phone rings and obviously, um, I probably took three or four seconds before I picked it up to, uh, compose myself. Um, cause I knew who it was going to be because <laughs> it was a strange, um, a, a number that was clearly an American number on there. And, and, and lo and behold, it was, yeah, it was, it was Hans Zimmer on the other, the end. Uh, and he said, I've got one word for you. Bond. <laughs> uh, and I said, yes, please. Yes, please. I'd love to do that. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so I don't, I don't know necessarily whether I was on Hans's radar at all before that. Um, I mean, I, I had worked with a couple of guys that, um, that had come out of remote control studios, um, such as, uh, Lorne Balf. So, it's possible mm-hmm. that that when Urs mentioned him uh, mentioned me to him that it, it would run a bell, but I honestly don't know. What, what, what was the what was the workflow? What was the workflow rather uh, working uh, with projects like No Time to Die and and Dune? Um, well, they were they were slightly different um, in that um, I mean, there's, there's there's a certain level of detail obviously I can't go into, but sure. But one of the main things was that working on No Time to Die was before coronavirus mm. uh so that was far more fun because i got to um go down to london and meet with hans and and his team and sit in his little studio down there and watch through the film two or three times uh and listening to a lot of the the initial suites that he'd written um to sort of start kick off the ideas for the, for the soundtrack um so that was obviously really cool because um, meeting people is a lot easier. And then with Dune, um, it was during lockdown, one of the, one of the lockdowns over here. Uh, so I didn't actually meet anybody in the flesh at that point. It was just pinging emails and, and sending files and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it was a mixture of things really. There's, there was synth programming, lots and lots of synth programming coming up with um, new and interesting sounds that, that fit, you know, the different briefs for both films. And, and then um, one of the ways that remote control works is that you get sent cues to put the sounds that you've created into in, in a creative context um, so that you're not just firing off sounds to be put in by everyone else that um that you were technically not writing as much it was it was very much sort of adding some extra color to cues and you know beefing up things here and there adding a bit more atmosphere here in, in other places and and then firing that off and some of those things hopefully stuck and uh, the sounds got used in other cues so you get new cues coming back with some of the sounds you'd sent them in so you thought all right that worked then um so it was a, it was a long process of, of of that really cues firing backwards and forwards and making new sounds and adding stuff to cues and sending it back to them to see what they thought um yes i think that's probably yeah, as did, good an overview of it as i can yeah, as did, i can conjure up did between. you hear any of your um your sketches you know from the the uh the cue process did you hear any of those sketches kind of make it into the into the final run um, I think I did here and there. I definitely heard some of my sounds peeking out. <laughs> um, because obviously there were, there were other guys doing synth programming and, and ambient sound design and stuff on there as well. Um, and I, I heard some of their stuff as well. So yeah, I mean, there were times where I'd hear a bass sound and I'd go, was that one of mine? It might have been. Um, <laughs> you can never be sure because again, I made a huge amount of sounds for Hans and his team. Um, so yes, there were, there were certainly some things that probably got in there. Um, and, uh, but yeah, sometimes you can't, you can't be sure yeah. that it wasn't somebody else's that was just a vaguely similar sound. Once it's been processed and it's been added to the mix with all the other instrumentation and stuff, it's, it's tricky. To no, tell. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wh- whether it's Dune or whether it's, you know, 
a TLC home shopping or home home network, you know, show <laughs> your your music gets mangled by the editors and everybody else and and gets incorporated in a way to where um you just have to kind of release it, you know, and 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 maybe you catch it, maybe you don't. Yeah. Well, I mean, for me the process is was was the best bit. Um whether I got a huge amount of sounds in the final score or not wasn't wasn't so important. It was it was having fun mm. making the sounds and, and working on on the soundtrack and and you know interacting with everyone and being a part of it really because you know it's 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 been a huge achievement I guess because um, I'm you know I'm I'm middle aged and I'm you know I'm I'm a dad with two kids and so I've never had any kind of um, ambition to to you know fly over to LA and live there and try and do that whole sort of lifestyle so being sort of sucked into into major projects and and working with Hans Zimmer is just um it's more bizarre than it is um <laughs> sort of my dream or anything but um obviously I'm I'm really grateful for those opportunities and you know being able to say that something I a score I worked on won an Oscar is 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 mad yeah that's yeah, that's that's absolutely astounding. One of the things um, that that Hans Zimmer and other composers, such as like Mac Quayle, kind of blurring the line between composition and sound design, and uh, the internet mm. and forums are you know arguing: is this sound design <laughs> or is it composing? And and where is the musicality of it, or or whatever? But um, for you. Um, where, where is, is there a line between those, those two things? And when does, when does something become harmony or melody versus this is sound effect, sound shaping or sculpting? Is there a line for you? Um, I think, no, I don't think there's a huge line. I mean, I think it's, it's, um, a matter of taste as much as anything else. I mean, you know, obviously I've seen all the online arguments about how nobody writes um, like the, the golden era of the, the 20s and 30s anymore, which is hardly a surprise. But but things like, you know, Music Concrete and, uh, and the Radiophonic Workshop have been around since the 50s and 60s. Um, so, you know... We're not talking about something brand new here. Synthesizers and an analog synthesis is decades old. Oh, yeah. Um, the fact that, you know, sweeping Lawrence of Arabia style string motifs don't dominate, um, music scores these days is, is just, it's just development, isn't it? It's just progress. Oh, I yeah. mean, you may think it's negative progress, but it is still a progress of swords. You know, I think. I think there's an element to which I'm probably going to get hate mail now <laughs> that um, a lot of people who are, you know, are firmly embedded in the world of composing now, they very much um, were influenced into becoming a composer by listening to John Williams' score, which are obviously full of full of melody and leitmotif and, 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 and harmonic expression, and all that sort of thing. And, you know, the stuff that sounds cool sounded cool when you were a kid is the stuff that you know sits in your heart until you're dead, and you will always champion it. So, um, so you know, I'm 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 a lover of early '80s synth pop, and will always you know believe it's fantastic, even even though you know you can listen to some of it and go, well, that's that's quite twee and plastic, <laughs> and and probably the production values are horrendously ropey but you know it'll always mean something to me and i'll always be able to listen to it so well it, it's interesting that you know the music doesn't sound like you know films of the uh 30s and 40s and 50s well but movies don't look like movies of the 30s and well, 40s exactly. and 50s so it's least. yeah it, it would be incongruous to put a a sweeping lawrence of arabia score for tenant that hmm. just wouldn't it wouldn't make any sense or uh uh, Mr. Robot. That just wouldn't. It wouldn't really work. I don't think. And so, um, yeah, I, I think. I think probably to a certain extent in the past, um, 
there are there are some even classic scores for films that that now feel a bit like instead of being part of the film they kind of slightly sit on top of it mm. if you know what i mean um a really a, an example i could i could pick up for um when i've really really noticed it but again this is obviously personal taste thing is the the 80s uh, fantasy film legend mm. with tom cruise mm mm-hmm. Um, so there are two scores for that film. There's the one I absolutely love, which is by Tangerine Dream, which I think sounds amazing and works beautifully with it. And then there's an orchestral score, and I'm going to completely forget who did it. Um, my brain is saying Elliot Goldenthal, but I'm not 100% sure whether that's correct. I'm sure someone can pick me up on that. <laughs> we'll have um, some, somebody in the comments will let us know. Yeah. And whilst the music is nice, it does feel like it sits on top of the film and doesn't sort of blend with what's on screen at all. Um, probably lovely to listen to in isolation, but it doesn't work with the film for me. Um, so that's, that's for me an example of when, you know, just because something's got classical orchestration and it doesn't necessarily make it superior. It yeah. still has to work. Yeah, especially as uh, movie music kind of transforms it, especially those, those era of the movies move into the realm of concert works, you know, mm. uh, that, um, I don't know, is that, that does the audience expectation. Like I, I have a hard time like seeing if the Dunkirk soundtrack is going to show up, you know, in a concert setting or like the tenant soundtrack, for example, or 1917. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, Hans is out there doing his, um, his live tour mm-hmm. thing and, you know, he's he's always the kind of target for, you know, melody versus sound design. But it, he's clearly able to put on a show yeah. which features, you know, music that people can hum and whistle along to. Um, and, you know, Inception's not the most melodic of um, of film scores, and that, that makes up a, a significant part of it, I think. So... Yeah, I mean, there are there are obviously things that you're not going to want. You're probably not going to want to listen to something like um, uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross a lot, you know, in a live auditorium, because um, you know it's 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 not something you sit down and and listen to in isolation yeah. so much. Um, but does it work with the the visuals on screen and the storytelling? Absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent. Well. Uh, <laughs> Matt, I, I want to thank you so much for joining me. And and I want to what what is what's next for you? What what do you have going on? Obviously, we're gonna have links to the unfinished.co.uk in the show notes below, but um, but what is next for you? What is next for me? I'm going on holiday next week. Um <laughs> congratulations, <laughs> you've needed, definitely earned yeah. it. Uh yeah, I mean it's not, I'm, I'm staying in the UK. I'm just basically taking the family down to London because um, my wife's family is down there. So we're just going to visit them and my wife's sister's had a new baby. So well, congratulations nice relaxing to family her. time. Well, okay. um, but that's not what people want to know about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, as we've mentioned earlier, I'm releasing generate noir at the end of this month, um, right at the end of April. Um, so you never know, this might go out before then you might still get your exclusive if you're, <laughs> if you're quick. <laughs> I am uh, and then I've adjusting got, my release schedule. I've got some other stuff coming out. I'm working, currently working on um, the sound set that I'll release after Generate Noir, which is um, probably June time. In fact, I've, it's actually set up on my, my uh, system now, so I can play you a, a sound from it. Oh, yes. I'll play you a bass line. Let's hear it. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I'm not sure that's coming through Zoom, but it's nope, a little, little, little taste of it, a little teaser enough to yes, uh, wet the whistle. Really, really well. the, the, it was it being a bass line. There's probably absolutely no bass came through there at all. <laughs> Never mind. We won't do a competition for someone guessing which synth it was because it'd be impossible. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, just a couple of releases. Uh, more releases towards the end of the year as well. Um, this is actually my 10th anniversary as the unfinished this year. I started out in 2012. Um, and I did have, did have a few big plans for things I was going to do this year, but 
actually, I've just been kind to myself. The way I'm celebrating it is to do as little as possible. Well, self care is taking well, some time out. Oh, self care is something that we in the uh, media composing industry we we will often sacrifice at the altar of the gig, you know. And so, oh, I, th- I think personal, relational, physical, psychological health is all super important, if not more important than than the job. Obviously, there are times when you have to burn the candle on both ends, and those sprints those happen, but. That should yeah. be the exception and not the rule. That's what I feel. Yeah. Well, to a certain extent, I learned that slightly the hard way last year in that, in that um, you know, I had a pretty tough year personally last year in that both my parents passed away. Oh, I'm sorry. To hear and that. so my my um, drive to work was not really there. Um, so I only released, I think, maybe three sound sets last year. And there was a temptation to sort of, throw myself back into it this year and just sort of go right let's let's get some work done um and what i actually changed changed my mind in sort of beginning of january to doing was i thought well how about i have another slow year but a year where i'm not you know the reason i'm having a slow year is for good reasons Mm -hmm. and not you know because i'm handling things like grief and depression and all that sort of business um so this year is very much as you say about self-care um and I'm 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 still doing synth programming. I might not have as as busy a release schedule, but I'm I'm continuing to add to my horrendous backlog of unreleased <laughs> sounds. <laughs> well, so, you, you mentioned so the backlog, but there is so much there already. I mean, you you have you have such a, a, a deep well of sounds uh, from Absinthe, Diva, FM8, Contact, Massive, I'm just reading them off here, Omnisphere, <laughs> Phonek 2, Repro, uh, Serum, Trillion, uh, Uno LX, uh, Zebra, Zebra HZ, and good old-fashioned WAV files. So folks, you, you again, you've seen me go on endlessly about Matt's work in my live streams. Uh, check him out. He's just he's he's just a, a, a person just like me and you, and uh, he just happens to make sound sets that end up in Oscar-winning films. <laughs> Other than that, though, we're the same. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a person. Yes, well, I'm Matt, definitely qualified for that. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me, and I wish you all the best, and I and I hope you have an amazing rest of your 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It was a lovely time. A huge word of thanks to Matt. Uh, Stop what you're doing right now, pause this episode, and go to theunfinished.co.uk and vacuum up every sound set he has, because he's, he's not only an amazing synth programmer, but he's just a more amazing human being. So Matt, thank you so very much. Let's change gears, and now let's take a listen to Mellow Corp by a member of the 52Qs community, Andrew Thomas, and I thought it'd be really interesting to talk about what it means to write a corporate cue, and what does what does corporate even mean? So we're going to take a listen to it and talk about it on the other side.
That was Mellow Corp by Andrew Thomas. Thank you so much for submitting this. He submitted this during our week th- uh, our week 15 thread. And uh, one of the reasons, like I said, I wanted to talk about this was to talk about corporate queues. So let's define first what it means to, to, to have a corporate queue. Generally, it's upbeat, it's positive. These are going to be the types of queues that live behind like instructional videos, very safe, uh, usually uh, lots of, of ostinatos, a little bit more slow building. You're not going to find a lot of really kind of hot edit points because these go behind kind of explainer videos. And in that aspect, they really need to blend into the background and be relatively you know, inoffensive. And that's what it means to, to write like a corporate cue. And you have to change your brain a little bit when you go to write them. You have to, you have to approach them a little differently the same way you would if you were writing a trailer cue. You can't take a trailer structure and apply it to just a different, you know, chord structure or a, a tonality, whether major versus minor and the instrumentation and call it corporate. You have to approach it differently. So, I really, really, really dig this, and uh, the Mellow Corp. Uh, the the title is a little, it's a little dull, I think, but uh, it, it could work. It's one word, and so that that could work. I like, you know, that, that you said Mellow, uh, but uh, generally, using the word Corp in the title kind of puts us into using what type of cue it is in the title. So you wouldn't like if it's a hip hop cue, you wouldn't say like hip hop. Or, or you know, tension or something like that. And so writing corporate cues, for some folks, it feels really kind of, I don't wanna say like boring or dull or whatever, but uh, I know that there, there are, you know, composers out there that don't like writing corporate. And in the term corporate, I'm putting in air quotes here, feels like an ugly word, but so many of these types of, of cues get written and many times they don't, they don't lead to a lot of back-end royalties. And this is actually something that, uh, that, Andrew, you mentioned in your post, and you said it's probably more suited for stock music than sync. And I think you are right there. I think you're right. Because, like, if, uh, if, if Honda is making a walk-around video, or if, you know, Pfizer is doing a, an internal training video or something, then they're going to go to a service like Pond5, Motion Array, Audio Jungle, these types of, of, of royalty-free libraries, because they just need something that they could throw in, pay a little license fee, and you, you get a little money, and then the uh, service gets a little money, and you kind of walk away. I don't know how many of these cues are generating a ton of backend, but I know that the stock libraries use these a ton. So I think you're probably right there, but that doesn't mean you can't write it. That doesn't mean you can't necessarily pitch it, but also uh, pitch it to other libraries. Also keep in mind with these type of corporate cues like this, you're, you're not necessarily dealing with super skilled editors. You're not dealing with an editor who is wrangling 90 plus different cues in one episode of a reality based TV show. Instead, they they need a cue that they can stick and put underneath and then fade out as needed and all of that. And with with all of that having been said, I think your cue is right on point. And you have some some of the uh, the 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 hallmark textures of corporate cues. You know, if dramedy cues are all about the pluck plucked pizzicato strings, then corporate cues are all about some piano, some chill chords and that delayed electric, super safe guitar, not quite U2, not quite Coldplay, somewhere right in the middle. And I think we are we are spot on with that. Um, if anything, I feel like we probably could have gotten to the guitar a little earlier. I don't know about that kick drum at the beginning. I would just... Just go right into the four on the floor. I don't think you need the kick necessarily. It's my opinion. Yeah, I would introduce the guitar right there. Probably would have introduced the uh, the pads or 
or the bass, maybe the bass coming in in the second phrase, just so it ramps up a little bit more steadily because, because I would put the guitar, I would put that idea. Um, Cause as it is, we're waiting almost four phrases before we bring the guitar in, which again, isn't inherently bad. You're doing a pretty good job of layering as you go. But that, that guitar part is, for lack of a better term, it's the hook, right? It's, it's the primary melodic motif. As simple and straightforward as it is, it is, it's doing the primary lifting of the cue itself. And so I think you could bring it in a little bit earlier here. Mix is sounding good. Everything's really working together. And I love the little blue, blue, blue. That's, uh, that's really nice. Into the breakdown, and you did a really good job of keeping the rhythm cooking during the breakdown. Back that up a little bit to maybe the little I could see some 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 sweeps, some super, super subtle, delicate sweeps and risers, I think could be nice, almost like waves crashing, but don't use like a wave sound effect. would probably bring out the acoustic a little bit more during this, the finger picking into the breakdown here. Let's back it up. And let that be kind of the primary driver. Probably could have heard one other like kind of floating texture, just so we have on the next phrase, a little energy to build. And that sound, that that boom, that that gliss down in, really really nice. Uh, uh, what would also really work, helping onboard that uh, returning back to our A section, is take your uh, a guitar note and reverse it. Just one guitar note, uh, you know, something something like that. You like my you like my impression of the uh, of a reverse guitar. Love everything going here. I probably would have had the bass kick on the quarter notes because we're keeping big footballs, big whole notes throughout the beginning. But once we get on the other side of the breakdown, yeah, so let's get, let's get jump forward. Just really super subtle. Love the bass sound, but we just want a little bit of forward motion. Because now we have this, this also, hmm, you could have hinted at that in the second half of the breakdown. Not even the full melody, but just fr fragments of it. But do you hear how just, and for everybody else listening or watching, do you hear how just inoffensively pleasant this is? That that is that the crux of writing corporate music, and again, I'm, I don't use the term corporate pejoratively. It's it's just it is what it is. Now, not a fan of those claps. The claps feel a little too a little too and in your face. I think some snaps. I love the fact that you you went to the straight two and four here. So instead, of boom. Instead of that kind of reggaeton uh, pattern there, I love the fact that you went to the two and four. But I think I would have would have kept it chill. The claps don't feel feel mellow. I think some that would have been nice. And you're probably going to want to uh, to double hit that. Or try to get away with not hitting a downbeat. Shh, don't tell anybody. You're always supposed to put the button on the downbeat of the measure. All of my full sale students have heard this for 10 years. However, you might be able to get away with something like mm -mm -mm -mm. and then really hit and for and. In which case you would want to make sure that everything comes together right there. 
and that could be really, really nice, which I think you're kind of leaning into already, but uh, I would, like with the kick and everything else, really, really make that make that the landing zone. But uh, Andrew, thank you so much for sending this along. Like I said, Andrew's a member of the 52 Q's community. And every week we put a thread together where you can come on to the 52 Q's uh, at 52 Q's.com, join the community and add your own Q. This was for our week 15 thread and we're in the middle of week 16 and we would absolutely love to have you. Like I said, we are 100% supported by members just like you of the 52Qs community. Now, you can join the 52Qs community for free just by heading over to 52Qs.com. However, if you want to support the network and if you want to support the community, then you can do so in several ways. The first, and I think the best way, is to become a member of the 52Qs family. You get access to the music production live streams every single week. You get access to Zoom office hours, our monthly live Zoom interactive workshops, and most importantly, live Zoom critique and feedback sessions where I listen to your cues, answer your questions, and provide my thoughts on them. Or you could become a member of the 52 Cues Friends, where you get access to the music production live streams and the monthly workshops. Or you can join the 52 Cues Patreon, where for just $1 a month, you can join us for our music production live streams. All the links and information is down below. So check that out. We would absolutely love to have you with us. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And uh, once again, thanks to Andrew Thomas for sending his cue along. But that's going to do it for us this week. I hope you have an amazing week. Until next time, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2022, Dave Croft, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the 52 Cues community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Cues.com.